Okay, hello. Um, let me. Um, hello. So, uh, before I start talking about Locke, are there any questions about the syllabus or anything like that? Assignments? Not that many people here yet, so. Okay. Um, so I'll just start talking about Locke. His name was John Locke. Um, there is dates. Um, so I always stay when I start giving biographical facts that, you know, you should remember I'm not a historian. When I first actually, I, I'm glad I didn't, there's no recordings of the first time I taught this course, because I said things that were like totally wrong about Locke's biography. And I think even recently, I was pretty wrong about Barclay on some things. So, you know, uh, um, it's like chat GPT, it may give you false information. <laughs> but, um, but I am learning, you know, the more I think about Locke, the more I, I uh, look at him from different points of view, the more I've been drawn into learning at least a little bit about his real life. Um, so uh, um, he studied medicine at Oxford um, and um, he actually practiced medicine for a while. So he was a physician. Um, also, while he was at Oxford, he was involved with um, a group of experimental philosophers, as they call themselves, uh, but now we would call them scientists, right? Um, gathered around Boyle and Hooke. So like he wasn't a central member of that group. He was a kind of younger hanger on, I believe. But, um, um, but for example, when you see him discussing chemical experiments in this book and like what might happen during chemical experiments, he's talking about something he's actually done. Um, after he left Oxford, uh, this isn't the only thing he did, but this is the only thing I'm going to talk about. <laughs> um, he worked for uh, Anthony Ashley Cooper, the first Earl of Shaftesbury. Um, he was the he was the grandfather of the Shaftesbury, who's famous as a philosopher, if you've heard of him. But anyway, this was that was the third Earl of Shaftesbury. This was the first Earl of Shaftesbury. He was a powerful um, and controversial figure. Um, and at first he was uh, um, a royal favorite of Charles II, and then he fell out with Charles II and um, sort of founded the anti-royalist Whig party. Um, so uh, um, Locke worked for him first as a physician and I guess um, saved his life when he had a liver infection or something. Anyway, um, but uh, afterwards he worked for him as his secretary. And um, Shaftesbury was one of the Lord's proprietor of the colony of Carolina, right? The Carol colony of Carolina was called Carolina because it was founded by Charles II or during the reign of Charles II anyway. Um, and it was controlled by a, a small group of Lord proprietors. I mean, that is the projected colony was controlled by them. There wasn't much there yet, actually. Um, and uh, Locke ended up writing a constitution for the colony of Carolina, um, which uh, notoriously that constitution uh, includes slavery. Um, 
at this time, of course, uh, black slavery in North America was just getting started. Um, I don't know if in some ways that makes it worse, but uh, um, and it, it also included a lot of other bad stuff like hereditary serfdom. <laughs> um, presumably Locke wasn't in favor of these things. He was writing the constitution, the Lord's proprietors asked him to write, um, but it still raises certain questions about him. Um, and uh, if you take Phil 144, uh, you can hear more about that from me. But for now, since it doesn't, it's not irrelevant to what we're going to talk about. It doesn't come up as directly <laughs> um, as it does in 144. In any case, um, in the run up to the revolution of 1688, Right, the revolution of 1688, Charles II's successor, James II, they suspected that he was going to uh, try to take the country back into Catholicism. And I guess now we know that he was definitely uh, personally Catholic. Whether he actually meant to do something to the kingdom or not, I think is unclear, but Shaftesbury um, and therefore Locke became prominent on the anti-king side, the Whig side, and eventually Locke had to flee to Amsterdam um, because he was suspected of being involved in a plot to assassinate, Was it? I think it was Charles II, not yet James. He was suspected of being in a plot to assassinate Charles II. Uh, whether he was really involved, I think historians now mostly think he was not in, actually involved, but he was associated with people who were. Um, so he had to flee to Amsterdam and he didn't return until after the Whig side won in 1689. Um, and his main works, uh, his most important works, the essay concerning human understanding and the two treatises on government, were both published pretty soon after that, um, although they were both written earlier, um, um, partly when he was still in England and partly when he was in exile in Amsterdam. Um, that's everything I want to tell you about his life, um, but I do want to add something about his reputation, I guess. So a lot of people seem to think that Locke either um, is not too bright <laughs> or is kind of nasty or both. Um, um, The nasty part we won't talk about so much here. I mean, the slavery thing is is part of it, but I think his defense of property uh, in the two treatises has, uh, you know, um, especially given him a bad reputation in some quarters. However, be that as it may, um, uh, the not too bright part is gonna come out more in this book. Um, and like, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't agree. I don't agree with either of these actually. Uh, the more, uh, I've read and taught Locke, the more I've come to respect him. Um, so, um, uh, although of course I don't think he's right about everything. I mean, you know, we don't, we don't teach philosophers who were right about everything. There aren't any great philosophers who were right about everything. And uh, I guess not any not so great philosophers who were right about everything either, right? So, well, I mean, you know, that's that's just, that's not even really interesting, right? I mean, teaching Locke because, uh, because it's interesting and uh, thought provoking, but also because it's part of our intellectual history. Um, we don't really know what we ourselves are talking about if we don't know where our ideas come from. So, you know, uh, having said that though, I mean, I will do my best to make Locke um, 
seem plausible in cases where a lot of people have thought that he that he's not. Um, and I guess one other thing, I probably should have said that before you this before you started reading him last time, but uh, his his writing style is, uh, um, I mean, he's the the oldest of the three people we're reading, so he's farther from us, farthest from us in time. The language has changed somewhat here and there. Uh, this edition has a glossary in back. Um, or is it? No, not a glossary. It has notes in back um, that are mostly about telling you what words mean. Um, so, um, so if something sounds kind of weird, you can look in the back here and see if there's an explanation. Um, but uh, more than than the you know individual words changing meaning, the idea about ideas about what constitutes good style in writing have changed, right? I mean, like nowadays, if you're taught how to write well, you're taught to be like kind of direct and forceful, uh, use vivid images, uh, you know, don't beat around the bush, whatever. Um, in this time period, and I think. I don't know if it's still true now. It was certainly true quite recently, still in academic German. Um, the, the idea of writing well was more like that you would make each sentence into a really complicated puzzle, sort of. <laughs> that you would have to that you would have to take apart to, you know, to get the whole meaning. It's it's like an idea that comes from Cicero, actually, is an ancient uh, idea of how to write well. And and Locke is. Locke does it well, <laughs> but it can try our patience. Um, also, he tends to beat things into the ground. Um, if he has an opponent who says X because of Y, he'll say, you know, well, Y is false and X is false. And even if X were true, it wouldn't imply Y, <laughs> right? Um, and he might give three or four arguments for 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 each of those. Um, I, you know, uh, that stuff is still sometimes interesting, but to some extent, you know, I haven't assigned this whole book. There's definitely more parts of it that I wish there was time for, but there's other parts that I'm not so sorry to have us skipping because they're not that interesting. Um, so, um, um, but still, you know, even in the um, parts I've selected to read, you it, it may take some patience sometimes. Okay, are there any questions about Locke in general before um, I start to talk about what goes on in this book? Okay, so the first, oh, there's a question, yes. Sorry, I uh, arrived a little late. What was Locke's, so was Locke just a pure philosopher or did he have a background in mathematics or any science or anything like that? Yeah, I was talking about, yeah, you did arrive a little bit late. Yeah, he studied medicine at Oxford and he was, um, and he was not like a great scientist, but he was associated with Boyle and Hooke and people, you know, who have laws named after them, like Boyle's Law and Hooke's Law. <laughs> and he had some kind of relationship with Newton, I think more distant, but, uh, um, and he did practice medicine for a while. So yeah, he had some connection to empirical science of the time. Um, any other questions? Okay, so the first thing, um, um, I mean, having said that, Well, I mean, we'll see. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see. There, there's there's certain things in in this book that are solidly 17th century physics, but there's a lot of things that you could understand even without that, just like general, general philosophical tradition. 
Um, okay, so the first thing I want to talk about, because um, I just I know from experience it causes problems, and um, and it's really important, but I feel like I never get it across very clearly, is the meaning of these two terms. I guess I should write idea first, which is the most important one. Idea and proposition. So I mean, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk in a second about what, like, sort of speak the ontological status of ideas. What Locke calls ideas are, like where they are and how they're related to our mind and whatever. But um, but in this context, um, what I'm interested in is um, um, kind of the logical distinction between an idea and a proposition. And basically, a proposition is made of ideas. Um, you, you know, from if you may have encountered this same distinction in other courses under the the uh, title of concepts and propositions, or concepts and judgments. A proposition is, you know, like a sentence that says something that's either true or false. And in fact, Locke says there's two main kinds of propositions, verbal propositions and mental propositions, right? So a, set, a spoken or written sentence is an example of a proposition, although he thinks the main kind are the mental ones, right? But so it's like a sentence, you know? So here's an example, like, um, all emeralds are green. I don't know if this is true or false, but it doesn't matter for these purposes. <laughs> Maybe some emeralds are not green. I don't know. But the, here, so the proposition is all emeralds are green. It says something either true or false, um, not either or both. It has to be either true or false, and it does it by say by like predicating something of something else. This is the way that um, since Aristotle and until, well, until is a little bit fuzzy, but anyway, definitely still in Locke's time um, and in Kant's, this is the way basically people think about a proposition. This is a model of it, like a model example. Um, uh, it says something that's either true or false by saying that some predicate agrees with some subject or disagrees, right? So you could say, all emeralds are not green. Um, and the ideas are the things that the sentence is about. It's gonna be, so it's gonna be, that is the proposition is gonna involve at least two ideas. If it's more complicated, there might be more ideas and Locke doesn't really explain very clearly how that works. Although he gives lots of examples like that, but it's gonna be at least two ideas. One is the subject and the other is the predicate. Um, okay, are there questions about that before I go on? Yes. Did you say that there were two types of um, propositions of verbal and what was the other one? Mental, right? Okay. So in other words, like, um, as far as Locke is concerned, and we'll, you know, a little later, we'll talk a lot about what Locke thinks the relationship between thought and language is. But as far as Locke is concerned, the proposition is something you first do in your mind, where you connect the two ideas in your mind. Then it can be expressed by a verbal proposition where you know you have a word that stands for one of the ideas and another word that stands for the other ideas and you have like some other words to put them together <laughs> um 
Right. So the main one is from Locke's point of view is the mental one. But um, but the reason that it's, it's of course, like I can never give you an example of a mental one. <laughs> right like i can't write a mental one on the board the one on the board is always going to be verbal so that's why i wanted to 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 say that right away so like you know this is this is this is an example of a proposition but it's not the fundamental example it expresses it and the the, the fundamental the mental proposition consists of ideas the verbal one consists of words that stand for ideas Okay, so um, so um, this distinction is going to come up right away because the purpose of this book, the essay concerning human understanding, is to ask, um, number one, on what basis does our knowledge rest? knowledge and well-justified opinion or rational judgment. Locke is interested in both, although he seems to be more interested in knowledge. Again, when we get to the beginning of book four, I guess we'll, uh, I'll talk more about the, you know, the definition of knowledge versus rational opinion. But in any case, so the main purpose of the book is to ask on what basis does our knowledge rest? And therefore, what are the limits of our possible knowledge, right? Like if you know where all our knowledge had to come from, how we had to, to get it, then you can figure out what things we could possibly know and what things we couldn't. Um, and obviously, we know the answer is going to be all our knowledge comes from experience because he's an empiricist. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, but um, but the relevance to what I'm talking about now is um, that knowledge consists of propositions or involves propositions, is about propositions. I'm not sure exactly what the right way to uh, describe it is, but basically, according to Locke, we have knowledge when we can become when we can be certain that some proposition is true. Now, by like can be certain, I mean like really can be certain, not just like think we're certain. <laughs> Right. So when we have, um, you know, uh, actual reasons that make it certain that a proposition is true, then we know that proposition. Um, so empiricism is going to say is going to be about where the propositions we know come from, how we, what is the basis for our certainty that propositions are true? And the answer is going to be experience alone, sort of. <laughs> so we'll see some of the ways that Locke is not um, the most radical possible empiricist. But that's the basic project of the book. And then uh, the so right, so empiricism we get certainty about propositions. that is knowledge from experience. And the competitor, the competing view that Locke considers, and this is what book one is about, we get this certainty because we have innate principles. So, 
So book one is, um, and I guess I should say, this is not clearly the only possible alternative to empiricism. Um, but it's the one Locke chooses to take on as his enemy in book one. It's not uh, even clear exactly who he has in mind, I think. Um, and whether there's anyone who would be rightly interpreted as holding exactly the view that he's attacking. But the view is interesting because Locke is attacking it. <laughs> so, um, so innate principles, what does that mean? It, so it means that there's certain propositions that were born being certain are true. And then from those, we can derive others. Um, whereas, right, whereas empiricism says, we're not born knowing anything is true. We have to learn from experience that certain things are true. And then again, from that, we can sometimes derive other stuff. So book one is all about this competitor, innate principles, and why the positive proofs given in its favor are ineffective. Right, so Locke is going to um, um, uh, showing why this innate principles view can't doesn't make sense, can't be defended. The other books will then that is the other three books, right? There are four books. The other books will be about um, how you can tell that Locke's alternative is correct, right? So showing that empiricism is the right answer. Um, um, Locke says, strictly speaking, he could ju just do that, right? He could just write books two through four. And um, if he could explain how we got, we could get, how we could get all our knowledge for, from experience, then there would be no reason to think of innate principles in the first place. But since, as I said, he's thorough, <laughs> He doesn't want to let it stop at that, and he wants to also show that the innate principles view couldn't be true. Now, um, in any case, what all of this means is that um, the, these innate principles are propositions, right? They're things, they're pieces of knowledge that we're born with. That is, as Locke understands it, propositions that we're born being certain are true. Um, so, uh, um, therefore, book one is mostly about propositions. It's also, there's a little bit of stuff about ideas in there, but um, for reasons I'll explain, but book one is basically about propositions. Propositions are made of ideas, but he doesn't actually start talking about ideas until the beginning of book two. <laughs> Um, uh, which, I mean, there's obviously reasons for this organization, but I also think it's a little bit confusing. And therefore, I'm going to start, talk about the beginning of book two first, about what ideas are and so forth. And then, hopefully, in some versions of this lecture, I have a fair amount of time for this, and in others, it's very rushed, but I'll try to get at the end, get back to book one and explain the arguments against the view that there are innate principles. Okay, are there questions before I go on about the general stuff I just said? This is basically the general structure of the book and stuff. By the way, I can't see everyone. So if uh, you raise your hand, I might not see you, but you can, I'm looking at the chat window or you can just speak up. Um, all right, so, okay, so as I said, um, that first explanation was about the logical relations between ideas and propositions and knowledge, right, like what ideas are good for in the big, bigger scheme of things. Um, now I'm going to talk more about like what ideas are according to Locke. Um, so, like, so, 
So I think kind of the definition of idea for Locke is Ideas are the immediate objects of mental operations or objects of mental operations. What does that mean? Well, um, So first of all, this word operation, let me start with that. So um, Locke and not just Locke, but Aristotelians and all kinds of people think of um, things basically, substances as having powers. Um, powers, uh, faculties, um, uh, capabilities, uh, potencies. These are all basically attempted translations of the same Greek word dunamis. <laughs> um, uh, and and Locke, I'm writing all of these up because, I mean, in general, you'll see people use one or the other of them. Locke uses possibly all of them. <laughs> um, definitely uses power and faculty a lot. Um, no matter how you look at it, the idea is that, like, um, even when something's not actually doing or undergoing something, there's something about it that makes that possible. That's its power or faculty. So like this isn't limited to the mind, right? Like, so for example, fire, if you think of fire as a substance, you think of fire as a thing, fire is not really a thing, right? Fire is just the gases coming off something that's hot. And the part where they're glowing is the fire, right? But that's not the way people thought about it. They thought, you know, including Locke, they thought fire was like water or air. It was a kind of thing, you know. So fire has like a power or faculty of burning. It can burn things. Um, but see, this is where I this is why I had to emphasize we're thinking of fire as a thing, and it's not really accurate. The fire doesn't have to be burning something at this particular moment. It can just be there. And that's not really true, right? There can't be a fire if something's not burning. Maybe I should use it. Maybe I should switch to a different example. Except this is such a traditional example. It's in Plato, it's in Aristotle, and Locke uses it too. So anyway, right? So uh, um, the the fire has the has the power to burn things, but unless something flammable is near it, it won't actually burn anything. When it actually burns something, that's called the act, right? So there's the power or faculty of burning. And then there's the act, or, and Locke more often says this, operation of burning. Right, so this is a distinction between potential and actual. The potency, potentiality, power, faculty of the fire is there to burn, is, even, is there even when it's not actually burning something. It's not burning something in act, or it's not carrying out the operation of burning something. This is an example of an active power or faculty. Um, it's also traditional, and Locke says, kind of apologizes for 
says this isn't really the right way to use the English word or whatever, but he goes on and does it too. It's also traditional to talk about passive powers or faculties, right? Like this thing, whatever it is, a piece of wood has the power to be burnt. <laughs> so when it's sitting over here, it has that power or potentiality or faculty of being burnt, but it's not actually being burnt. When it gets into the fire, it's um, potency is reduced to act. <laughs> to put it in a traditional Aristotelian way, right? It goes from being potentially being burnt to actually being burnt. And this could also be called the operation of being burnt. The oper or the operation of the power or faculty of being burnt. Okay, so, so much for fires. Of course, this book is not about fires. This book is supposed to be about the human understanding. So, but the human mind or soul, I think Locke uses these terms interchangeably. And by the way, he says, I didn't assign this, I don't think. I think it's an introduction. He says, um, in this book, he's not interested in the mind-body problem, right? Like he's not gonna, uh, he's not, except for an aside here and there, he's not gonna speculate at all on is the human mind part of a body, an aspect of a body, something different from a body? Um, he seems to think that last alternative is more likely, but he, um, for reasons we'll see, he doesn't think that's as important as you might imagine. So anyway, so I mean, so when I say, when I draw the mind or soul, you know, um, this could be a, this could be a body or a part of a body. Locke says that's not relevant for our purposes. What's relevant for our purposes is that it has certain powers or faculties. Um, so like, One faculty it has is the faculty of sense or sensation. Now I'm drawing this as a little circle in the inside the mind. Um, but the the truth is it's, you know, a faculty isn't necessarily a separate thing you can you can isolate within the substance that has it. And in fact, Bloch is going to say that in the case of mental faculties, none of them are, right? So this is, I mean, it's really just a way of considering the one thing that's actually there with respect to certain operations that it could carry out. But um, so nevertheless, to make it clear, I'm going to draw this power of sensation as if it were a thing inside the mind here, okay? So here it is. And like other faculties, it has an act or operation. So this is an operation of sensation. Right, so if I'm not sensing anything, I mean, I guess that never really happens, but if, I, if I'm not sensing anything, I, I mean, it never happens when I'm awake anyway. <laughs> um, so not sensing anything at all, I still have the power of sensation, right? I'm able to sense, I have the capability to sense, but when I'm actually sensing, then there's something else, the operation of sensation. Just like in the case where the fire was actually burning something, there's the operation of burning. So this is an example of a mental operation. Right. Mental operations are operations of mental faculties. There are times when we actually do some of the things that um, considered as minds we're capable of doing. But um, it's these oper these op mental operations are a strange kind of operation because um, 
they're about something. Now, I mean, you can sort of say that the operation, and Thomas Aquinas actually says this somewhere, that, that the operation of burning is kind of like about the thing that's being burned. Um, but um, um, it's not really the same kind of thing. Um, as I think he would agree. Uh, anyway, uh, that's not normally how we think about burning. We think the fire is burning something, but not that it has a burning operation about something. Whereas mental operations are about something. This is what's sometimes called intentionality <laughs> in later philosophy. They, um, they point to something outside of themselves. So like when I have an operation of sensation, I'm sensing something like, let's say this snowball. Let's say this is an operation of visual sensation. So I'm seeing the snowball. So I'm seeing something that's white. If I'm also like touching it, maybe then I'm feeling something cold. So the snowball is the object of my operation. This is this is what object, strictly speaking, means, or originally means, or something like this. I mean, in fact, the the word object is introduced by Aristotle in De Anima um, to talk about this relationship. Um, anti-kamenon, which usually means opposite, but there it means something else. Right. So, um, uh, I mean, nowadays we oftentimes use object as kind of like a synonym for thing or being, right? It would say like, oh, how many objects are there on this table or something like that. But the, the original meaning of object and the way Locke is using it object is always the object of some operation. I mean, we still use object that way when you when we talk about like the object of your desire. That's what object means there, right? The object of your desire is what your desire is about. <laughs> so similarly, there's an object of sensation, which is what your sensation is of or about. So, so far we have objects of mental operations and it looks like the objects of mental operations are, for example, snowballs, right? So where the ideas come in here? So the answer is, this is the way Locke thinks it works. The immediate object of a mental operation is always something called an idea which he says is inside the mind. Now, what exactly it means that it's inside the mind might be a little hard to understand, but maybe I should have drawn a mind bigger here. Here's the operation. Here's the idea. So what would be an example of an idea? Well, the idea of whiteness. So like when I see white, the immediate object of my operation of sensation is um, a white, white idea or idea of whiteness in my mind. And that represents, that is like stands for something outside my mind. What does it stand for? Well, basically it stands for the thing that caused me to perceive it. So the snowball, so this dotted line here is causation. 
the snowball. And so you can see from this that sensation is what kind of faculty? It's a passive faculty. It's like being burnt, right? It's not something I do. The snowball did it to me. <laughs> the snowball makes me somehow, and of course, all kinds of stuff has to go in here, like my eye and my optic nerve and whatever. But somehow the snip snowball makes me carry out this mental operation or undergo might be a better word for it, makes me undergo this mental operation of sensing this idea. And then I use that idea to refer, so this line here is reference. I use that idea to refer to in the case of sensation, the external object. Now, um, and so this for obvious reasons is called the double object theory. <laughs> um, there's two objects of my operation of sensation. There's, First of all, the idea, and then second of all, the external thing that it stands for. Okay. Um, so when Locke says the idea is the immediate object, oh. right? So immediate means that there isn't something else in between, right? There isn't a medium in between the operation and the object. What is there not in between? Well, basically what there isn't in between is um, um, any other representation. The operation refers immediately to the idea. It's immediately about the idea, immediately directed to the idea, whereas it only gets to the snowball immediately by means of the idea. Um, so, I mean, important to notice immediate doesn't mean like right away here. Right? It doesn't mean like it's fast or something. I mean, when we say do it immediately, the reason that means to do it fast is it means don't do anything else in between. Right? Like don't have a medium. <laughs> don't mediate doing it by doing something else first. Um, but but here it does it has nothing to do with that temporal kind of immediacy. It just means there's no other object in between the idea and the operation. It's the first object we get to. And it makes sense to call it that because there's another object that's not immediate, namely the external thing. Okay, so all of that is pretty fundamental to Locke's theory, and although it will change in Berkeley and Hume, it's still pretty important for understanding how it changes. So are there questions about that before I go on? Yes. So um, my question is really just like uh, in, in the model you have, does the operation or sorry, does the causation lead to the operation of sensation or yeah it, i think is that's there the a right medium? well okay so the causation so i mean as i said this this causation itself is not immediate causation right um all kinds of things have to be right between me and the snowball um for this to happen um, which I mean, Locke is is well aware of, obviously, and you know, um, so 
And in fact, he, he often will use examples like if the sense organ is out of order, you'll never sense the idea because the external object can't get to your mind to make you sense it, <laughs> right? So um, is, is that what you were asking or were you asking something else of it? Yeah, no, my only, that, that answers my question perfectly, thank you. Okay, yeah, I mean, there's something else to say, which is that sometimes Locke talks as if what the external object causes is the idea. Um, and, you know, I think this is a more careful or accurate way of putting it, that, that it causes me to perceive the, to perceive the idea. Um, uh, but, of course, in causing me to perceive the idea, then the idea has to be there. So, um, um, in a sense, it also causes the idea. Um, All right, any other questions before I go on? Um, okay, so the mind has a lot of powers, obviously, besides just sensation. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of mental operation. Some are passive, like sensation, and some are active. Um, Locke, like many philosophers, divides these mental faculties and therefore all mental operations, right? Because again, every operation is the act of some faculty. It's the actual happening of something that before that you had the potential to have happen, right? Um, so um, I'm probably going to regret erasing this. But, uh, um, so Locke, like a lot of people, divides these faculties into two main groups. And his names for these two main groups are thought and volition or will. Um, so this obviously is related, well, maybe not obvious, but now I'm going to tell you, this is related to the distinction I talked about last time between theoretical and practical. And this is something I should also have said last time, that Locke um, usually uses the Latin equivalent for theoretical. And so he says speculative. Speculative, speculatio is the Latin translation of theoria, right? Like theoria meant like observing or being a spectator or something like that originally. So speculatio was the Latin translation of it. So when Locke says speculative, distinguishes, for example, between speculative and, prax and practical innate principles, that's that theoretical practical distinction he's talking about, right? So, um, so all our faculties, our mental faculties are divided into these two groups. One is the one that has to do with um, um, its ultimate purpose is to know things, basically. Whereas the other is the one whose ultimate purpose is to do things. So therefore, you know, sensation, Locke puts, as Descartes does, under thought, right? Sensation is a form of thought. It's, again, Locke apologizes that maybe that's not the right way to use the word thought in English, but then he says, but that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, and in a way, sensation is um, the first kind of thought. Um, or at least it's a component of the first kind of thought. And the first kind of thought, generally speaking, is experience, right? So experience is Locke divides into sensation and reflection. Um, 
this experience is the first kind of thought because it provides the material that all, all other theoretical mental operations are going to work with. So, I mean, this is this is where Locke is a strict empiricist. When it gets to propositions, there's some issues. But when it comes to ideas, he says, all our ideas originally come through sensation or reflection. And um, what is reflection? So sensation is, you know, being caused to perceive ideas by external objects. Um, reflection is the same thing, only the cause is our own mind. Um, so he says, and this is um, book two, chapter one, section four on page 110 in this edition. Um, No, no, no. Um, right. Um, This source of ideas every man has wholly in himself, and though it be not sense as having nothing to do with external objects, yet it is very like it, and might properly enough be called internal sense. Right, so reflection is the same thing as sensation, except the... Um, um, immediate object, the ultimate object, is not an external thing, but is my own mind. Um, and um, I think it's important to understand uh, everything he says about ideas and reflection. I think this is important, but I know other people disagree. So, right, so this is my interpretation of Locke. I mean, of course, everything I say is my interpretation of Locke. People don't agree about what Locke means. <laughs> um, uh, but um, uh, from my point of view, it's important to understand that this parallel between sensation and reflection, they're completely parallel to each other. What do I mean by that? So like, so here again is the mind. Here's an act of sensation. Here's the snowball. So the snowball has a certain faculty, power, it has the power to cause me to perceive a white idea. Locke in the next reading is gonna call that the quality of whiteness or the secondary quality of whiteness. So here, here's the snowball's power and then there's an act of its power. It's actually causing me, this is so to speak, the act of looking white to me. That's what causes me to carry out this op or undergo this operation of sensation. And then I am able to refer to the snowball by means of an idea, the idea of what, right? So this power here is the quality of whiteness. This is the snowball. And this is the operation of looking white. Right. 
And this is the idea of whiteness. So when I carry out an act of reflection, according to Locke, what happens? Well, um, in this case, it's my own mind that I'm sensing, so to speak. Um, but it's just a little bit more complicated. Here's how it works. This, an operation of my mind, say this very operation of sensation here. Causes me to carry out an act of reflection. Right, so this is the power of sensation. And this is the power of reflection. And this is an operation of reflection. So this operation here um, has, in addition to being the, you know, um, operation of being affected by the snowball, is also the operation of causing this act of reflection. Under proper circumstances, right? So I have to be paying attention. And Locke says a lot of times we don't pay attention to our own mind. Um, the same thing is true of the snowball, right? Like, if I'm not paying attention, I might not see that it's white. But under the proper conditions, this operation will cause the act of reflection. And then, so here's the main point. Um, the immediate object of the operation is an idea. The idea of sensation. And so Locke says the idea of sensation is one of those ideas we get by reflection. And then by way of this idea, I'm able to refer, well, to what? So you could say, like in this case, you could say I'm referring to the snowball. The snowball is the immediate object. And that's most often what he does say. Or you could say, I'm referring to the snowball's quality of whiteness, which is also what Locke sometimes says, right? It's power of causing me to see white. Or you could say, I'm referring to its operation of looking white. So the same thing is true here. Like, what does this idea represent? Well, and one way of looking at it, it just represents my mind. All the ideas of reflection just represent my mind, but they represent my mind as having different powers. And in particular, they represent it as carrying out certain operations. So in this case, and I, there must be a reason for this difference, and I'm not sure what it is, but in this case, Locke will more often say that the, op, that the immediate object is the operation, right? So he'll say that sensation is about external objects and reflection is about the operations of my own mind. But, um, Right, like so for example, um, right before the passage I was reading, this is um, book two, chapter one, section two on page 109. Our observation employed either about external sensible objects or about the internal operations of our minds, perceived and reflected on by ourselves, 
is that which supplies our understanding with all the materials of thinking. All the materials of thinking are ideas, and the ideas are, we, we perceive these ideas either because of the action of external sensible objects or the internal operations of our minds. So if you ask, like, how do, what about ideas? How do we perceive ideas? Is that by reflection? The answer is no. How do we perceive the idea of whiteness? By sensation. It's the immediate object of the operation of sensation. That's how we perceive it. I mean, you could say we perceive this idea by reflection, right? But this idea in reflection fulfills the same role that this idea of whiteness does in sensation. So we don't have like ideas of ideas. We perceive ideas because they're the objects of operations. But we perceive operations, other operations of our mind through reflection. Okay. Are there questions about that? <laughs> I know these. this diagram is really complicated and that whatever I wrote there is pretty much illegible. <laughs> so, I mean, I tried to say what I was writing as I wrote it, but is there something you don't understand about the dial diagram or what I wrote there or? Yeah. Okay, just so I follow. Um, it starts with like from the like, or the model starts with like the causation of whiteness and it goes to the operation and then goes to sensation and then through a pathway to reflection? Well, okay, yeah. So, I mean, this is true. Locke does say that reflection can't get started until we already have sensation. But I mean, the object of reflection isn't always sensation, right? Like, I mean, all the operations of my mind can act on me in such a way that I can perceive them in reflection including reflection itself, right? So that's how do I get the idea of reflection by reflecting on reflections, <laughs> right? So, but it's true, Locke says that, you know, the mind can't start working at all until an external object affects it. So like the first thing that happened when you were born or when you were in the womb perhaps uh, is that you got some sensations. Um, as soon as you have some sensations, I mean, of course, you always keep getting more sensations. It's not like it stops. But as soon as you have some sensations, in principle, you can go on without them and do other operations um, or reflect on those operations. I, I think, am I answering what you're asking? Oh, yeah, I was, I was just like uh, interesting, interest in the like pathway to reflection that that makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, so this I mean, this part of it is optional, right? Like you can see mm -hmm. a snowball without reflecting on the fact that you're seeing a snowball, as, as I said, because you I mean, because you might not be paying attention to your own thoughts. Yeah, and, and can... Locke says, you know, that, uh, that, that, in fact, a lot of the times we're what we're mostly concerned about is external objects and especially when we're children but some people even later pay very little attention to their own thoughts uh, but of course if you want to do what Locke is doing in this book then you're going to have to do a lot of reflection <laughs> um yeah um i guess you know uh, I'm also trying to emphasize, though, that reflection is not like uh, some kind of super privileged way of sensing things, right? I mean, it works by the same kind of pathway as sensation does. So, um, 
um, you know your own mind basically as well as you know external objects. <laughs> um, I mean, that has to be qualified somewhat in both directions, but um, but roughly speaking, I think that's Locke's idea here. Um, so he agrees with Kant about that, for example, or Kant agrees with him about that. <laughs> um, all right. Um, let's see, how am I doing on time? Not great, but. All right, but I'll still, I'll, I'll talk about this. Um, so that's what ideas are. Ideas are the immediate object of mental operations. Now, I mean, so I just gave the simplest first mental operations or theoretical mental operations of sensation and reflection, but um, Locke is gonna talk about lots of other things that we do afterwards, like distinction and mem memory and distinction and abstraction and so forth. Um, so, uh, um, but as we just heard him say, all the materials for those other higher operations have to come first through sensation and reflection. Now, to understand in what sense that's true, um, we, I have to introduce um, the most important classification of ideas into different parts in the law. Or really, there's, there's two important ones that I kind of have to discuss together. So the first one is simple versus complex. And the second one is particular versus abstract. Um, and like most of book two is gonna be arranged around these classifications. He discusses simple ideas first, then he discusses different kinds of complex ideas. And in discussing different kinds of complex ideas, he especially focuses on abstract ideas. Um, so what does this first one mean, first of all? Well, like a snowball, for example, is something that's both cold and white. So if I'm entertaining or judging or knowing that a proposition about a snowball, like, um, well, let's say to begin with, it's like, you no, know, let's say it's like this snowball is, you know, what can I say? hard. This snowball is hard. So um, uh, this proposition is a relationship between two ideas. That is the mental version of it is a relationship between two ideas. What are the two ideas? Well, one of them is hard. Let's forget for a moment what that is. But the other one is snowball. So the idea of snowball has to contain, to identify something as a snowball, it's not enough that it be white. It has to be round, it has to be cold. All these things are part of the idea, or as we might say, or as Kant might say, the concept of a snowball. But Locke still will use the term idea for this, right? So the idea of, Snow of a snowball. At the moment, I'm still talking about the idea of a particular snowball. The idea of a snowball um, contains other ideas inside itself. The idea of white, the idea of round, the idea of cold. So that's a complex idea. The idea of, of a snowball is a complex idea.
And some ideas are more complex than others, both in the sense that some ideas are, have more components. And although Locke doesn't talk about this as much, but when he does talk about it, he, he claims it's true um, that some ideas have components that are themselves complex, right? Like the idea of a snowball fight. <laughs> um, I think Locke would describe that as having like different levels of complexity to it, basically, right? It contains the idea of snowball as one of its components, but the idea of snowball itself is complex. But, you know, like at least this is what Locke thinks, this process of breaking up complex ideas into their parts can't go on forever. Eventually, we have to get to ideas that don't have any further parts, and those are the simple ideas. So, like white and cold, for example, are supposed to be simple ideas. They don't have parts. That is, they don't have parts that are that are other ideas, right? Like again, Locke isn't talking here about what they might actually be. Like maybe they really are, you know, um, uh, little balls that bounce around in our head in a certain way, and those balls have parts, <laughs> right? But that's not what we're talking about here. the The, the question is whether the idea is, is can be decomposed into different ideas. And Locke is saying the idea of white, for example, can't. It's simple. Um, so, um, so first of all, to put Locke's empiricism more precisely, what he holds is that the mind can't make its own simple ideas and it doesn't have innate simple ideas. Um, the mind receives all its simple ideas through sensation or reflection. So um, that is from experience. Complex ideas, sometimes we can make out of the simple ideas we already have. Right. So even if you've never experienced a snowball, if you've experienced a cotton ball and an ice cube and various other things, um, uh, you can form either just by imagining it or by me telling you about it or whatever. You can form the idea of snowball yourself, even if you've never seen one. But uh, um, if you're blind, and this is a common example Locke uses, I can't tell you what white is. The simple idea, you have to get through it, your sensation or you don't have it. Okay, so that's one distinction. Other distinction is, and are there questions about that? I mean, I think this is the more straightforward of the two distinctions. <laughs> the other one is hard to understand. Okay, so if there's no questions about that. Now, I mean, we're gonna talk about this uh, in more detail when Locke gets to the operation of abstraction and talks about how abstraction works. Um, and this one also is gonna be very important because Barclay, um, you know, the two main places that Barclay will disagree with Locke is, oh, someone just, Oh, can you only get simple ideas through sensation? Okay, I'm about to read a quote that's relevant to that actually. So just hold on a second. So um, um, the two main things Barclay disagrees with Locke about are, at least in theoretical philosophy, are number one, that uh, he says, um, the immediate objects of mental operations are their only objects. So he's an idealist. That is, he denies that there are external things. 
<laughs> he says they're only ideas. Um, but uh, that's that's probably the more more famous or or more surprising of the two big disagreements. But the other one is Barclay says we have no abstract ideas. We have no power to form abstract ideas. So what are abstract ideas? And you know, um, uh, I think when you understand exactly what Locke really means by abstract ideas, um, a lot of things about the, him, the dispute between him and Barclay become clearer, and um, the puzzle I'm about to raise becomes clearer, or the solution to it becomes clearer. Um, but, um, uh, but like I said, I'll talk about that in more detail when we get to it. To begin with, you can just understand it this way. A particular idea is an idea that only matches one thing, like this snowball here. Whereas an abstract idea, also called a general idea or abstract general idea, right? Locke says all of those things. An abstract idea is an idea that's, so to speak, vague enough that it agrees with a bunch of different things. So instead of the idea of snowball in general, uh, sorry, instead of the idea of this snowball, we might find that form the idea of a snowball in general. And then everything that's white and round and cold agrees with that idea. Maybe you have to add some other stuff besides white and round and cold. But anyway, I mean, if you put a cotton ball in the freezer, it doesn't become a snowball. But anyway, <laughs> anything that meets the list of criteria in the abstract idea agrees with it. Meaning like I can think about those things. I can refer to those external things different external things, all using the same idea. Now, um, so here's the puzzle. Um, what kind of ideas do we get through sensation? Are the, do we get simple ideas only? <coughs> So um, if that were true, think about the simple idea white. Seemingly, it agrees with everything that's white. That is, I can use it to form a proposition like, um, no white thing is black, <laughs> right? Nothing white is black. And now I'm thinking about everything white in general using this one simple idea. So um, if simple ideas are what come in through the senses, it would seem like what we get through the senses first are highly abstract ideas. And yet, Locke also says, this is already back in book one, when he's arguing against the innate principles people, he says, like, um, the first ideas that an infant gets are particular. Right, so like the infant um, gets the idea of what? So we think it might be like their mother their nurse, because of course, Locke's upper class clients had nurses, right? <laughs> wet nurses. Um, but anyway, like their mother, their nurse, um, um, only later do they abstract. In fact, Locke says, only human beings ever abstract. So the non-human animals, we'll see when he gets to the list of mental operations, as we go along, all animals have sensation, he conjectures. Um, but no matter how simple, but as you get to the later mental operations, he'll say, but beasts, meaning non-human animals, 
do this very little, you know, or, or whatever. And then when he gets to abstraction, he says, this, I think, beasts do not at all. Only humans ever do it. So the other animals never have abstract ideas, but they have sensation. <laughs> so it must be that sensation delivers particular ideas. That's the puzzle. Um, and again, I'll come back to this later. All right, this is gonna be one of those times that I don't have a lot of time to talk about innate principles. Maybe I'll spend some, a little bit of time on it next or tomorrow. <laughs> um, uh, because I do, this passage is really important and I don't wanna go through this lecture without reading it, so. So this is book two, chapter two, section one on page 121. Yeah, and I guess I should apologize. So most of the reading was from book one, obviously, but um, the little bit of reading from the beginning of book two is fundamental. That's why I'm spending so much time talking about it. Okay, so, um, so this chapter is called Of Simple Ideas. And he says, um, Though the qualities that affect our senses are in the things themselves so united and blended that there is no separation, no distance between them. Yet tis plain the ideas they produce in the mind enter by the senses simple and unmixed. So what this means is that if you think of um, a simple idea as abstract in the sense that you've um, taken away everything else that might limit what it could refer to, and you're left with only this one simple idea, then in fact, according to Locke, the first kind of abstraction actually happens outside the mind, right? Like, so here's my mind and it's inside my head, or at least it's somehow connected to my brain that's inside my head. And this is kind of similar to that picture that Dolly drew for me. I think it didn't manage to quite get the hands of reach the snowball. Um, so um, in the snowball, there's a power, a power to look white, basically, right? That's a power to cause me to perceive the idea of what? In the snowball, there's also a power to feel cold. That's a power to cause me somehow to perceive the idea of cold. Those powers are what Locke calls the qualities of the snowball. And he says, again, let me, Oops, I went too far. The qualities that affect our senses are in the things themselves so united and blended that there is no separation, no distance between them. Meaning, I mean, in a way, this is kind of obvious, right? Like the whiteness and coldness of the snowball are like not separate from each other. It's not like you could take one off the other. 
let alone that one has already been separated from the other somewhere. They're both in here. They're both even because of the same thing about the snowball, that it's made of little pieces of ice. <laughs> um, you can't take them apart from each other. So here, whiteness and coldness, thought of as qualities or powers in the snowball, are inextricably mixed with each other. But by the time you get to my mind, I've got two different ideas. Why does that happen? Well, it's not done by my mind, it's done by my sense organs. Right? I mean, this is basically what a sense organ is. <laughs> a sense organ is like a specialized detector that reacts only to some qualities of objects and not to others. <laughs> right? So like if you change the temperature of the snowball, it, it won't affect what's happening in my optic nerve here. Um, you have to change the color. And vice versa for whatever organ it is that's sensing cold there in my finger. So, like I said, the abstraction in a way has already happened before the ideas reach my mind. And the question, then, like the solution to that puzzle has to be the question is what is still left to do that Locke is going to call abstraction? Okay. Um, oh boy, I have three minutes left. I will have to talk about innate principles next time, I guess. Um, but, um, I never let things slip too far out of sync. So if we get to the end of lock and there's things I haven't covered, I'll just go on to Barkley. <laughs> um, but for now, I'm gonna let this slip to the next time, except uh, is there something quickly I can say to introduce it? Yeah, so let me say, so innate principles, um, So innate principles are, first of all, they're supposed to be principles. So they're supposed to be propositions that we're, we're born being certain are true. Um, and Locke says that means, of course, it can't mean that we always, from the time we were born, have been thinking of these principles up until now. The principles are supposed to be these very abstract principles like it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. This kind of sounds more like Aristotelianism than Cartesianism actually, but I'm not sure exactly who he has in mind. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but anyway, so the, so it's not that we've been thinking that all the time, but Locke says, but when we do think it, we must remember having thought it before. Otherwise it was not gonna count as innate. So like, I guess in some sense we must have thought this at the instant we were born. <laughs> I don't know. That makes it sound pretty silly, which of course is Locke's point. He wants it to sound silly, but, um, but it's not just anything we were born knowing. It has to be principles means like first principles, right? I mean, first principles is actually redundant. Principle means first, <laughs> right? So these have to be, because remember, this is supposed to be an alternate theory of what all our knowledge is based on, not experience, but principles. So principles have to be like fundamental things that we could deduce the rest of our knowledge from. And Locke's, and like a big part of Locke's argument against this is going to be, it's only part of this, it's, there's a lot of parts of this argument, but a big part of his argument against this is going to be that principles like that 
would have to contain very abstract ideas like being and possibility. And he says, um, are infants born with any ideas? Well, he says none except maybe some vague ideas of warmth and hunger and pain that they that they got in the womb. So that's really just kind of a technicality, right? I mean, they're innate because they got them before they were born. <laughs> but they got them by their, their prenatal experience, so to speak, right? It's not really an exception to empiricism. But anyway, he says, look, those ideas are not, you can't build the fundamental principles of knowledge out of that. Um, for that, you need this long process of experience, acquiring lots of simple idea or particular ideas and then learning to abstract and abstract more and abstract further until you get to ideas like being and possibility. Um, so, um, so the poss so so innate principles can't be real because the, the 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 proper ideas are not innate and basically no ideas are innate and propositions are made out of ideas right so you you can't think it's impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be without having the ideas of being non-being sameness or identity and impossibility. <laughs> and since you can't think it, you can't know it. And so you can't have known it when you were born. Okay, like I said, I'll say more about that next time. Thank you for coming. Uh, next time is tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we'll see you then, I hope. Bye.